Glory to you, Lord God of our fathers. We praise you tonight. Glory to you. Glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In the collect for this Trinity Sunday, we pray, Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us your servants grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity. This prayer speaks to the great importance of Trinity Sunday in the church year, a day in which we celebrate the power, the mystery, and the majesty of the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, and yet one God. That is, the Holy Trinity is central to a true profession of the Christian faith, while at the same time, the centrality of the triune God is what sets Christianity apart as the true faith. Now, if Christianity is the true faith, then what does that naturally imply about every other religion? It means that every other faith is a false faith. Now, this is not easy for us to hear, I understand that, nor is it easy for the secular world to hear. But we cannot shy away from the truth because it is difficult. Trinity Sunday therefore reminds us that a profession of faith in God as Trinity is to assert the exclusivity of the gospel message. How many of you have heard someone say something like this to you before. It goes, religion is like the story of the blind men and the elephant. A bunch of blind men, you see, they live in this village, and an elephant is brought in before them. Now, none of these men know what an elephant is because they are blind. And each of them examines, because they are blind, this elephant with their hands by touching it. And since each man touches a different part of the elephant, each man claims that the elephant is something different. The man who touches the trunk thinks it is a snake. The one touching the leg calls it a tree. The one touching its side calls it a wall, and so on and so forth. That's what religion is, man. We're all just blind people trying to describe different parts of the same elephant, so they say. Or maybe you've heard religion described this way. We're all on the same journey. Everyone's just on different paths to discover the deeper meaning of life. You've probably heard something like that many times before. Brothers and sisters, such statements couldn't be further from the truth. The only way that worldview works is if you refuse to examine any system of faith beyond a surface level. But as soon as you engage seriously with the truth claims of different religions, you realize that many, if not most, are fundamentally incompatible with one another. For example, it isn't enough for one to say that you believe in God. There are numerous monotheistic religions out there Gnosticism, Sikhism, and Zoroastrianism, to name a few. You could take it a step further even and limit it to just the Abrahamic faiths, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Of course, it only takes a casual understanding of world events to see how Islam could never coexist with the other two. Now, even putting that aside, it is Christianity that stands alone in recognizing the triune God. And from that perfect unity, God the Father sent forth his only Son to take on flesh and die for our sins, fully revealing the mystery of God in his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. 
This is why St. Paul, in our second reading today, exhorts the Corinthian church, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Not any faith, Paul writes, but the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this is about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Either Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, or he isn't? This is a question every single one of us must answer. And the answer which God requires of us is not the one which will be popular with the pagan world. Our struggle to contend for the faith, both within our own hearts and without, that is, with those around us, the world, is of course nothing new for the church. In fact, the church has had to guard against heresy since her birth. Early in the fourth century, a presbyter named Arius in Alexandria, which is in North Africa, began teaching that Jesus Christ was not truly God. His teaching would become known as the Arian heresy. The Church Universal responded decisively in the year 325 AD at the first ecumenical council of Nicaea, the council from which we have the Nicene Creed, and that was and became the preeminent statement of the faith, which confessed that Jesus is, in fact, truly God. Toward the end of the 5th century, another creed was written that delved further into the mystery of the Trinity. Though attributed to St. Athanasius, the bishop of Alexandria and great fourth century opponents of Arianism, which we just described, and who lived from the years 296 to 373, this anonymous creed came at a later stage of debate. The creed of St. Athanasius declares that its teaching concerning the Holy Trinity and our Lord's incarnation are the Catholic or the universal faith. In other words, that is what the true church at all times and in all places has always confessed. More than 15 centuries later, the Church Universal today continues to confess this truth, confident that the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has given himself for our salvation. Now, reading just the first six lines of this creed reinforces the centrality of the Trinity to the church's identity and our own salvation. I'll take out just a few lines here because it is very long, which is part of the reason why we don't use it in our daily order of worship. It reads, Whosoever desire to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled will without doubt perish eternally. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. In other words, God is three in person, and one in essence. The Trinity exists in perfect unity. It cannot be divided. We do not worship three separate gods with their own distinct and unique or quirky personalities. No, the members of the Godhead are equal in glory, equal in majesty, equal in their eternal nature. God the Father did not create his son Jesus. Jesus is co-eternal with the Father. The members of the Trinity are also perfectly united in love. They don't quarrel or fight over who is the most important among them. The Trinity never needs to go to any sort of counseling. If all this thinking about the Trinity is making your head hurt a little, that's fine. That's to be expected. That's the very reason we describe the Trinity as a mystery. 
because our minds are finite and cannot grasp the fullness of God's glory. There's an amusing story about St. Augustine I was reminded of as I was preparing for today's sermon, and it discusses the mystery of the Trinity. According to this legend, one day while he was writing his treatise, De Trinitate, on the Trinity, Augustine went for a walk along the beach. And St. Augustine, as he was preparing to write this great work, had spent years contemplating the mystery of the Trinity. And now here he found himself walking and thinking about substance and essence, unity and eternity. His head was probably also hurting. And as he was walking, Augustine noticed a young child. He was sitting on the ground and he was digging a hole in the sand with a seashell. The child would dig and dig, and after a few minutes, he would get up, he would take the shell, and he would walk over to the ocean and scoop out some water and bring the water back and pour it back into the hole. Then the child would dig some more, scoop up more water, and pour the water back in over and over again. St. Augustine watched for a few minutes, after which he approached the boy. St. Augustine asked him, What are you doing, child? And the young boy replied, I'm putting the sea into this hole. But that's impossible, Augustine responded incredulously. Then the boy stopped for a moment. He stood up and he looked deep into St. Augustine's eyes and said, It is no more impossible than what you are trying to do, trying to comprehend the immense mystery of the Holy Trinity with your small intelligence. Shocked, St. Augustine turned away, and once he turned back, poof, the child disappeared. As Augustine learned in this legend, to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and to worship the unity requires humility on our part. When we let pride get in the way, we can either fool ourselves into thinking we can grasp the Trinity in its entirety, in which case we always get it wrong, or we think we can do away with this sacred mystery altogether in a favor of a God of our own making. Which brings us to our very long reading from the book of Genesis, which our sister Barbara so kindly read for us, the story of creation. On the first day, God created day and night. On the second, the arrangement of water. On the third day, dry land and vegetation. The sun and moon on the fourth day. Fish and birds on the fifth. Animals and finally human beings, male and female, made in God's own image on the sixth day. After the fifth day, God looked out upon his creation and saw that it was good. Ma'od in the Hebrew. But after seeing his special creation, man and woman made in his own image, God declared it very good, or tov ma'od. Realize it was not just God the Father who was present for the work of creation. Rather, it was the Holy Trinity, the triune God, in perfect eternal unity, who created the heavens and the earth, the same God in whose image we are made. As we just sang, the God is perfect in power, love, and purity. The creation account is one great demonstration of God's perfect power, literally speaking the universe into existence. The perfect harmony of the Garden of Eden, God's creation before the fall, is a reflection of his purity. And the creation of man and woman in his likeness, made for union with one another and for careful dominion over all creation, reflects his perfect love. So perfect was this love in the garden, so unbroken was man's harmony with God, that God himself could walk beside Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. We recall this as we sang, Sweet the rain's new fall, sunlit from heaven, like the first dewfall on the first grass. Praise for the sweetness of the wet garden, 
sprung in completeness where God's feet pass. Our rejection of God when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit was a rejection of that divine harmony of the Trinity and the unity that comes with him. A rejection of the glory of the eternal Trinity is therefore a rejection of the true faith. And that since that first rejection, we have sought to replace God with something else. Without right worship of the triune God, we are bound to destroy every virtue which is perfectly embodied by the Trinity and once reflected by his creation in the Garden of Eden. Distortions which are now amplified by the proliferation of modern technology, the creation of artificial intelligence systems, which in a sense designed to be pure power, but lacking love. The rejection of self-sacrificing love in favor of pride of sexual self-expression, sacrificing harmony with nature to at once worship and degrade it, and absent true religion filling the gaping trinity-sized hole in our hearts with a pursuit of transhumanism, seeking to transcend everything which God designed as tov ma'od, our bodies, indeed biology itself, and God's creating us as male and female. Looked at through the lens of our gospel passage from Matthew 28, our Lord Jesus Christ, co-equal member of the Trinity, sends us forth into a world which is trying its hardest to build God, to replace nature, and to achieve immortality through technology. But Jesus sends us forth with all authority in heaven and on earth, and he sends us forth with the answer to it all. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. There is a trinity-shaped hole in the hearts of our friends, our family, and our neighbors. And for we who are in the faith, our most important job is to love them by serving them and by preaching the gospel, by bringing them up in discipleship and praying that the Holy Spirit bring them to a place of repentance and baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And as we go out, brothers and sisters, know that our Lord walks with us every step of the way to the end of the age, as he once did in the dew of the garden. May the joy and peace of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and be with you all this Trinity Sunday. Amen. Amen. Amen.